Week 7, Thinking Out Loud, Lecture 2.3, Utopian Literature and Art Through History, How We Imagine the Good Life and the Tropes That Make Us Fall into Dystopian Panic. In the last lecture, I listed all the utopian literature I packed into a suitcase in London and hauled around the world, ultimately dragging it upriver for two days in the jungles of Borneo, where I was doing rainforest research and meditating on ways to improve our civilization using biomimicry principles gleaned from observing one of the last remaining stands of virgin rainforest with all its marvelous biodiversity and ecosystem complexity. The thing about utopian literature is that all of it is fiction. Nowhere on the planet do we have any examples in reliable historical records of any civilization that truly got it right. Despite mythology about golden ages for the Egyptians and the Greeks with various equivalents for Chinese and Indian societies, it appears that all we know of utopia is that attempts to describe it were written during bad times in opposition to current events in order to suggest another way of being might be possible and that although some of the ideas contained within the novels did come from observations of real places and practices, nowhere were they all combined such as the author described them. Hence the word utopia with a U actually coming to mean nowhere. William Morris even made this point in his utopian novel News From Nowhere, while Samuel Butler, 20 years earlier in 1872, had played with the word nowhere, reversing the letters to become the title of his utopia, Erwan, which is now the name of a health food store. As we mentioned in the previous lecture, Thomas More in 1516 had left the E and the O off of utopia so that the reader could decide whether it was real or not. And literary critics have determined that much of what he described in his book were real practices observed in the newly discovered, from a European point of view, worlds, particularly the habits and philosophies of the Iroquois Confederacy in what would later become known as the United States. In fact, much of what the Iroquois taught made its way into our American Constitution. The United States of America, it should be said, was explicitly an experiment in thinking and making utopia out louder, combining the best of ideas from around the world that the international immigrants who settled here brought with them. If only the nation hadn't been forged at the expense of the genius of the native inhabitants and the genius of the Africans who were brought here in chains. We are told by politicians that we should make America great again, but history shows that we have always fallen far, far short of our utopian dreams and need to rethink the whole enterprise. Still, making America great is possible because we have all the elements. When I lived in the echo villages of Los Angeles and Tamara, Portugal, and visited many others, I realized that so much of what we were thinking and talking about, and some of us actually doing, to bring about the ecotopia that Ernest Kallenbach describes in his 1980s classic novels, Ecotopia and Ecotopia Emerging, were already happening not just in the echo villages, but around the world everywhere. Traveling around the subcontinent from Mumbai to Delhi with the India Youth Climate Network Solar Solutions Tour in 2009, in Reva electric cars with a solar-powered rock band and biodiesel and solar support vehicles carrying the documentary crew, I learned that somewhere in India, all of the solutions we need were already in place and working, from biodigesters to gasifiers and pyrolyzers to clean cook stoves to photovoltaics to wind to solar thermal concentrators to plastic bands to eco-friendly cups and festivals to industrial ecology parks. The reason we were traveling around India was to document them and try to connect the people doing them so that hopefully somewhere they could all be put together in at least one location. The closest we came to finding that paradise was Roy Bunker's Barefoot College in Rajasthan, where the arts and the sciences were being taught to scores of previously illiterate women from all over the developing world so that they could return to their villages able to weld, solder, design, and create renewable energy, water purification, and organic food production systems, and able to teach others using puppetry, music, song, dance, theater, and computer presentation skills that they acquired at the Barefoot College. Barefoot was the closest I have seen to a long-functioning utopia. Now, I was so enthusiastic that one night around 2 a.m. after a long discussion with the founder over wine, I even asked if I could stay there and teach. Bunker Roy said, 
love to have you, but I'm afraid you are far too formally educated to be a real asset. You see, you are a product of the very system we are trying to correct. You went to Harvard and UCLA, you have a master's and a PhD. You're completely steeped in the dysfunctional culture we must replace. And you are male, and you look white. And hard as you may try, and I think you are doing great work, don't get me wrong, but as hard as you may try, you will always carry the baggage and biases of that system in you. We decided long ago that we would only hire women, preferably women over 30, and from historically disenfranchised and marginalized groups, which you call of color, who truly understand the needs of the other 90% of the planet, who've been neglected, and whom it is our task to educate in the right way. The only men we ever hire are those from surrounding areas. So I think what is best for you is to go back to your own culture and try to change it from within, using everything you see working for us here, but in your own way, appropriate to others like you and from your region. It was a powerfully sobering realization to be an Indian, one of the most hopeful places on earth, learning that people don't really feel what we have to offer in the West and in our modern institutions has much value and can even be a threat, much like Caliban in Shakespeare's The Tempest. But of course, that is always the shock that visitors to utopias go through in the novels when they visit places that get things right. The people dwelling in sustainable locations view us with bemusement when meeting us individually, and often with great compassion, kindness, and even love, but consider our methods and ideas a kind of madness that is rather threatening whenever it dominates. I learned this perspective also from Angangak, Angang Okorsuak, Ice Wisdom, who Jane Goodall introduced me to as Uncle when we were speaking at the Earth Summit in Johannesburg in 2002. Uncle took me and Professor Scott Sherman of UCLA into a back room after Jane put us together, and he said, Listen, my nephews, for over five centuries, we indigenous peoples from around the world have been meeting up around the world to discuss what we should do in the face of the Holocaust you Europeans brought us. For hundreds of years, the wisdom was that if we could retreat to parts of the earth considered remote by you, deep in rainforests, high in mountains, out in deserts, up in the Arctic ice, you would leave us alone. We could continue living as we always have, adapting and evolving our cultures and technologies in the most appropriate and sustainable manner. And we would watch your civilization collapse like so many before it that we observed and resisted getting caught up in for thousands of years. Basically, we thought we could wait you out until now. You see, he said, Many descendants of the expansions of empires think that we indigenous groups were somehow lost to history, that we didn't know about the marvelous things that you were doing with your technologies, but we knew, and we observed, and we determined that you were not just brutal, but suicidal. So we elected not to join you, not to modernize your way. But now things have changed. The effects of your toxic society have now covered the entire earth and there is nowhere for us to hide. Even in the Arctic Circle, where my people try to continue our ways living off the sea, we can no longer depend on nature. The ice is melting, the trees are dying, the animals are dying, the ones that remain are poisoned with mercury and lead and radiation. We can no longer produce or hunt or gather enough food to keep our families healthy, and we cannot adapt to the extremes of heat and cold and the storms that the climate changes you have caused or creating. That is why, for the first time in our history, our indigenous council of leaders around the world have decided that we must start to trust a few of you as, as allies. We've been observing the Echo Village movement that you belong to for some time, and we think some of the technologies you're experimenting with are worth adopting to our lifestyle. So I want to empower you with this task. Go out into the world and find us the best ideas and technologies for sustainability and try them out. Life test them for us until you're sure they really work, that they will really sustain. And then come back and share them with us. Will you do that? I promised him that we would. On September 20th, 2014, after the Indigenous March in New York City, I ran into Uncle by surprise at a ceremony that night at the Nicholas Rorick Peace Museum. We ran across the room to one another, and he grabbed my shoulders and started moving me in a circle. A crowd began to gather around us as he spun me around, and he began traditional throat singing used by the Inuit people as an expression of joy in sacred ceremonies. 
When the singing was done, he sat me down and said, My nephew, I knew we would meet again when the time was right. What have you found for us in your journeys? Uncle, I said with tears in my eyes, In 2009, in the slums of Pune, India, I discovered the small urban home biogas solution for turning all food wastes and toilet wastes and organic residuals that can make high densities of human and animal populations so dangerous into safe and clean fuel and fertilizer for growing healthy food without soil. I experimented with it in the slums of Cairo where I was living, and then in my home in Germany, and then here in New York at Mercy College, and in people's homes here and in Pennsylvania, and I discovered a cheap and efficient way to make them out of IBC shipping containers that are found all over the world. And with National Geographic's help, I've taught people to build them all over the world, from Africa to the Middle East to Asia and South and Central America. It truly is the best solution of all of them. I see it as the central solution, the solar plexus of the food, energy, water nexus, the missing piece of the sustainability puzzle. He was delighted and said, we will be building a sustainable community in Greenland to help us get through this climate change problem. This will be a wonderful tool for us. Thank you. Let us work on making this happen. In the years since, I've continued to work with other indigenous groups. After meeting with Chief Arvel Looking Horse and Hereditary Chief Phil Lane Jr., they corroborated Uncle's story of what the elders have been doing and what they want to do to help not just themselves, but all of us get through this dystopian time and move toward the utopia promised by all spiritual traditions. So the work goes on, only slowed by the embarrassingly small number of people willing to commit to this vision, a vision that seems so obvious to those of us doing the work. Why haven't you heard of this? Probably because most indigenous groups were completely denied the opportunity to think out loud. Literacy was systematically denied to people with alternative viewpoints, and the media and outlets for publishing views that might challenge the status quo were rarely, if ever, given to people on the margins of our empires. Certainly, the empire builders did not want to provide any platform or megaphone to such radical voices of dissent. It is one thing to let a radical or heretic talk and publish when what they are saying still involves the logic of capital accumulation and power concentration. A socialist and a communist can get up on a soapbox in a capitalist state and vice versa, so long as they're all still preaching a world dependent on fossil fuels and collectivized agriculture and industrial production and concentrated wealth and power. You can dream all you want out loud if you're talking about the redistribution of wealth as long as you still believe in private property and the concept of wealth to begin with. Most indigenous peoples practiced and still practice a form of self-sufficiency that is antithetical to gross accumulation of anything. The people between them and civilization, the peasants, who were semi-autonomous and linked the city and its bourgeoisie to the landlords of the countryside, were constantly being brutally oppressed so even their thoughts could never really be heard out loud. In fact, anthropologist Eric Wolf's classic book, Peasant Wars of the 20th Century, makes the case that almost every war we fought since the start of the Industrial Revolution through the colonial era and for decades after most empires collapsed have been attempts to crush peasant uprisings when they finally decided to express their desire for their inalienable self-sufficient rights. So of course you aren't going to hear what has been going on in the minds of the most self-sufficient of peoples around the world. Whatever anthropologists recorded would be twisted and biased by our own Western lenses so as to fall into some fantasy of the noble savage narrative or, or some justification for continuing the project of trying to civilize the poor savage as Shakespeare talked about in The Tempest. Huxley's famous dystopian novel, Brave New World, tries to tackle this problem through the character of John the Savage, who is half-white and is finally allowed to leave the squalor of the reservation he was born on and is brought to the urban metropolis to learn its wonders. The novel is a speculation on the failings of our capitalist, socialist, communist system to produce anything resembling the good life. Huxley's Island took that even further with a utopia that is on the verge of succeeding and then fails because the oil companies decide to bomb it to hell. 
The problem with all such fictional tales, as well as factual accounts, is that almost all of them have been thought out loud, written, spoken, created, by people who, as Bunker and Troy accused me, are saturated with the biases of our dystopian reality, even when we're drunk on the possibilities of utopia. At the core of this is an argument that inheritors of our Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, continental Europe, British, American empires have been having for millennia. Are we here to play in the fields of the Lord, or are we here to work like ants? Play or work, and, and for whom exactly? Should we trust in God and consider the lilies and the sparrows as Jesus would have us do? Or should we strive to be industrious and responsible as many a school teacher as well as slave owner tried to force people whom they considered to be shiftless and lazy? This argument is dissected very nicely by Bernard Suits in his 1982 classic, The Grasshopper, Games, Life, and Utopia. In this dialectic piece, Aesop's Grasshopper from the fable The Grasshopper and the Ant argues with two philosophy students, Skepticus and Prudence, who think the grasshopper's life is an unsustainable folly. But Suits uses the grasshopper to correct our vision so we can see what many an indigenous group always knew, that playing a game is a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. As with Paul Lafargue, The Right to be Lazy from 1883, the central argument is that human beings shouldn't have to work if they can overcome unnecessary obstacles, and that all work should be only to overcome those obstacles. The point of life is to find joy and feel pleasure, and if something gets in the way of that, it needs to be overcome. But Suits and Lafargue and others, particularly those who have spent thousands and thousands of years dealing with the obstacles that nature itself throws at us, argue that overcoming obstacles needn't be drudgery, needn't cause misery, needn't be torture. Instead of work, we can play our way to success, just as the young of all mammals and birds do. Play is work, but it provides its own intrinsic rewards. It is, in a word, fun. Mark Twain said it best, work is anything a body is obliged to do, play is anything a body is not obliged to do. When we play, nobody can question our motives. The task is its own reward. No hidden motives, unless you don't understand evolutionary psychology. The ulterior motives, as E.O. Wilson attests, are deeply ingrained in our psyche, going back to our pre-human ancestors. We play golf because it reminds us of exploring the ancient savanna. We play soccer and football because it activates ancient neural pathways associated with pursuing prey on a collective tribal hunt in a grassland ecosystem. We love bobbing in the surf at the beach and combing for seashells because we spent millions of years diving for clams and mussels and fish and foraging along the coastline. You don't have to convince people to play on the field or the beach. They'll do it for free or they'll actually pay for the experience. The value is so ulterior and yet so tied to a long history of survival that we hardly question it. The experiences bring us joy and through that positive emotion, we're motivated to continue the activities which, over our long evolutionary history, ensured our survival. Now imagine that we were able to make all the activities that ensure survival in the postmodern era seem fun. Reading nonfiction books and technical manuals and textbooks, for example, is that fun? Some of us find enormous pleasure in such pursuits. We read with great passion the out loud thoughts of other human scouts who went into the wilderness of industrial and scientific and historical discovery before us and fortunately reported on what they learned in a medium others could benefit from. But I've noticed that those of us who enjoy playing with nonfiction and almost never considered reading and writing and doing math to be homework had already internalized the ulterior motive that by learning how to do scientific research or construction or process or rhetoric or law or the craft of writing or persuasion without obligation we will still then be able to do better and increase our well-being and joy. I contrast this with the attitudes of so many students I know when I taught in the public high schools who said that they hated reading and hated studying and would rather be off at the movies. What they really hated was the feeling of obligation and the fear of being graded, of course. And this has always been true where power-holding elites assumed everybody else was lazy, 
He didn't say he was slow, he was tired, he didn't do well. He said he was lazy. The second word is shiftless, and then there's a third word that goes along with it. The early utopian novelists knew that too. And so they did their out loud thinking about how to achieve sustainability and justice in fictional stories whose plots and tropes and narratives and, and colorful characters tapped into the archetypes and symbologies that, as Wilson stresses, have intrinsic interest to most members of our species. Reading an adventure story or a love story about a person very much like you, visiting a utopian dreamland very much unlike your dismal region on the Earth, provides uplifting stimulation and is so fun that people were and are willing to pay for the experience. We pay to play. We expect to get paid to work. If we can get paid and play, all the better. And the utopian thinkers who were able to make a living thinking out loud by writing about sustainability and justice truly had a nice gig, wouldn't you say? At Patel, we hope you will be able to engage in sustainability earning where you earn while you learn, yet never learn in order to earn mere points or money, realizing that learning and thinking and creating sustainability truly is its own reward, because in the most ancient sense, it really is the only game in town.